Okay, it's about time to get started with our next panel. Um, our next panel is Lunar Infrastructure Requirements and Opportunities, and I will go ahead and turn it over to the moderator, Kevin Green, so he can uh, uh, start the panel and do the introduction. Uh, hello and welcome back. Yes, me again. Uh, I'm going to speak very briefly because you've already heard, heard mine. Uh, I want to introduce first, uh, introduce our panelists here, uh, Dr. Jaime Benarroya, who's uh, from at Rutgers University and has published ex uh, extensively on space engineering construction. In fact, I first met Jaime at that, uh, my first ASCE space engineering conference in 1992, where he published a couple of very interesting papers, including the one about soil damping that just might affect some base layouts that people are kind of overlooking some factors that he pointed out back then. The, uh, our Next panelist down the row here who will be speaking last is Dave, Dr. David Livingston, who's, uh, who speaks in extensively on uh, space business issues and uh, is also the moderator and uh, runs the Space Show online on radio, which is a very interesting ongoing uh, radio forum that's streamed online. If you don't listen to David regularly, you, uh, you really need to. And then down on the end, we have our, our final panelist, who I'll introduce him. Uh, Hugh, Hugh Vigo? Sorry. Arif. Arif, sorry. Hugh, Hugh Arif with the Cisco, excuse me, Hugh, I'm a little distracted here this morning. I apologize. Um, Hugh Arif with the Cisco Corporation who will speak on the uh, infrastructure a aspects of wiring up the or data services. So uh, we'll start off with uh, Dr. Ben Arroyo. Take it away. Well, it's great to be here. Um, I appreciate the invitation. Um, as Kevin mentioned, uh, I'm on the faculty of mechanical and aerospace engineering at Rutgers, and my background is in structures and dynamics. And um, I, become, I became interested in lunar structures uh, back in the late 80s as some of these conferences started. And I wanted to figure out, well, how can I apply some of what I know to lunar structures, which is a very exciting field that will eventually uh, happen. You can't hear me? OK, thanks. Uh, I'm told that we don't have much time, so we're going to go right to the questions. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Um, just a couple of points. You know, this is uh, this tends to be one of the more uh, motivational kind of of conferences, and um, and I put the, I, I brought some uh, artist rendering lunar structures might look like, some of the infrastructure might look like, and I know that they seem very far fetched, and um, but they're only far fetched in your mind because in reality. That there's really nothing that, that we can't conceive that we can't make happen. So the limitations that, that uh, are there are our own limitations. And there's a real good quote that I, uh, I like and, and I probably will start using it more often, and that is, uh, what would you do if you know that you would not fail? And that puts, your, puts you in a whole different perspective because many times we sort of set up limits for ourselves and that stops us from doing stuff that, that we don't do because we're afraid of failing. So this, this session is on lunar infrastructure requirements and opportunities, and um, what I'm going to show you are, are some concepts for lunar structures uh, that have been around for a long time. Um, I have a slide or two on some ideas that I have on, on returning to the moon and how to build structures there a little bit more, more easily. But th the main point is that the form follows the function. Well, here's a nice structure, and let's figure out what to do with it. The structure really has to be a response to some need. And so as the business community, uh, as the scientific community decides what it wants to do on the moon, that will determine what these structures are going to look like. And obviously there are common elements, especially if, when, when humans are going to be in these structures, there, there are engineering elements that have to be part of that. And I'll, I'll talk about that very briefly. So lunar infrastructure requirements will depend on what kind of operations we have to do on the moon, uh, as far as just maintenance, what kind of businesses we're talking about, that leads to the various kinds of structural types, and there are some generic types that I'll point out to quickly. And all of that, will, and, and how we build those structures will depend, does depend on the environment that we find in the moon. The environment meaning from the engineering point of view. What are the loads uh, of all kinds that the structure has to withstand? Uh, what, what are we going to do on the moon? So in, in a very generic way, we're going to find some way to create energy, solar energy, or nuclear fusion future kind of energy. And so we're going to have mining operations. And you can start seeing some of the kind of structures that we're going to talk about that, that, that will have to be created for the lunar surface. 
and we're going to have tourism. The top two are Lunar Hilton uh, concepts back from the early 90s. One is outside, one is inside. At the bottom is the Marriott competition. Um, the one on the top is an interesting concept because it has this huge meteorite coming and uh, about to hit it. So those are for the people who are the, the space tourists that really want a very extreme environment. And the, the, uh, <laughs> the inside of that lunar structure looks like a, a mall. Uh, and that's kind of disheartening, but this is one concept. So you can see the, the lunar surface, and you can see all kinds of stuff there, what looks like a Coca-Cola symbol. And the Marriott is a more, more a bunker kind of uh, concept. And the, the different kind of structural concepts, the infrastructure that will, will be on the moon, um, I, I group them in first generation, second generation, and, and beyond, or maybe generation and a half. First generation basically is what we bring with us. We, we have no infrastructure on the moon, so we bring these essentially uh, tin cans, we place them in various configurations, and that's our first lunar base. And we see some of the constraints, some of these are, uh, are very early concepts. The one on the right is a Boeing concept from the, from the Apollo era. Uh, and you can see that the shielding is placed on top. I don't think this can point. Um, you can see some astronauts there just to give you a scale. Second generation would be once we're there we, and we start knowing how to use the local materials, uh, then our structures will be partly brought from Earth and partly made on, on the moon. And third generation would be structures exclusively made from local materials. And I think one of those panels this after, uh, later on today talks about in situ and clearly, in order to survive on the moon, one has to be able to live almost totally from what we can use on the moon. The kind of structures, uh, and this is more second generation, after we've been there a little bit, uh, can be grouped into inflatable structures, cable structures, rigid structures, and buried structures. Here's some, some, just some quick examples of uh, concepts of a, this is an inflatable structure. And most inflatable structures are inflatable to be brought there and then and rigidized, and then they're a rigid structure for the most part. Here's another inflatable structure. It's a cutaway where the shielding uh, is, is shown only partially placed on top, and that shielding is to um, uh, shield against radiation and micrometeorites. And as you can see, the best laid plans sometimes don't work. Here's an inflatable structure after it's been inflated and partially rigidized as well. This has a toroidal shape, which you really can't see. This is a concept using a lunar crater that's prepared and then cabled, laid out, and then eventually covered and pressurized as well. Uh, all structures for human habitation would, would need to be pressurized, and it turns out that the internal pressure of somewhere between 10 and 15 pounds per square inch becomes a design load on that structure against all other design loads. Here's a modular approach, basically using the lunar regolith um, as a material from which blocks are created, placed together, and some larger structure created as well. I don't have any concepts to show you um, buried structures. Some people say buried structures are the best because they provide the best shielding. Of course, th then the issue is you need some sort of infrastructure to create the space underground and then build and, and support that. Here's a self-erecting structure. Uh, I don't know about you, but I have a lot of interest in self-erecting structures. This one is um, in, in a sphere, comes in, and, and the idea with these uh, structures is that uh, basically they're, they're very small when they, when they are uh, put together and, uh, and then they're transported to the site and then the issue is um, the deployment and deployment can be a very big issue from an engineering point of view. This is a, a tide arch shell structure which we designed at Rutgers a couple of years ago and still working on. Basically you see two tide arches and the tie at the bottom, the, the, that becomes the foundation. It, it's an igloo-like like structure and what we did is we actually went through a full design using actual design codes, everything from uh, the, the, the steel, uh, used aluminum, the, the welding, all kinds of uh, things, and uh, we use a very high factor of safety of five, which is about uh, four, four times as large as an earth, earth structure, just to see whether it was a feasible kind of design. So these are now uh, more advanced concepts, which may or may not come out this way, but you can see the various elements of an in infrastructure developing. You see solar panels in the back, you see partially inflated, inflated structures, you see astronauts on, on the lower right corner. Okay. Another uh, concept uh, with uh, various infrastructure elements there. Um, now, for example, in the middle of that 
uh, schematic is an open structure, probably for um, uh, maintenance of, of uh, vehicles. So what are the issues for, from, this, from the engineering point of view? Well, obviously the gravity is one-sixth, and so that affects the strength of the structure. Uh, but then again, one has to worry about the internal pressurization. So gravity gives you a benefit, but internal pressurization then becomes the, the design for a contained structure. And then shielding. Uh, radiation micrometeorites are, are both very important uh, loadings on the structure. Uh, and also shielding to insulate the structure from uh, the temperature differentials, daytime to nighttime. So unless that structure is shielded, uh, one, one can have very large uh, strains in the structure. The structure might, will, will fail unless it's shielded. Uh, people are talking about using regolith to cover that structure somewhere in the order of 2.5 to 3 meters. Um, and that obviously adds dead load to the structure. But again, the internal pressure is the design load for, for most of these concepts. Oops, I made a mistake. Thank you. Thanks. Other design loads might be from dynamic loads, accidents, uh, plant accidental decompression. The hard vacuum is an important point from the, uh, from the perspective of uh, exotic materials. What might have outgassing from ex exotic materials in that hard vacuum. Uh, the suspended dust um, that we've seen from the Apollo pictures are uh, very important from the point of view of machinery design and all kinds of um, designs. And finally, the uh, seismic ringing, uh, even though uh, seismicity is not really uh, an, uh, an important load uh, as far as the literature, uh, we know that the moon has a very different kind of seismic uh, signature than the Earth does, in that the, any seismic activity, uh, just from impacts of, of meteorites, uh, will last a very long time, whereas on Earth, the uh, seismic activity is relatively short. And um, I think this is my last slide. Um, so thinking ahead. Uh, all those structures look really nice, and um, uh, most likely the first base will be either a, a rover-like structure or a tin can kind of structure. Um, we've been doing some work to see whether we can use some of these advanced concepts that we have on Earth for um, layered manufacturing technologies. Um, and so the idea, which, which is what I'll leave you with here, is uh, perhaps we can uh, send up specialized rovers, uh, not rovers, robots, small uh, specialized robots that could use the local materials um, as a material from which they could create a shell of the first lunar base. And we know we can, we can do layered manufacturing here on Earth and basically create almost any kind of topology in three dimensions. And so the idea that we've been looking at is to see whether we can use uh, the uh, existing material on the moon, uh, send up these specialized robots that could then um, create these, these kinds of shells that the astronauts would find when they get to the moon rather than having to bring all this stuff with them. Um, the last thing we want is to create a system where the astronauts are the construction workers on the moon. Some of that is possible, uh, but certainly we want to put it onto, onto the robotic um, back. And then the astronauts would come and then finish off that structure. I think that's the last one, right? Yes. So thank you very much. Um, I want to take some questions now. Yes. Um, Okay, Kevin suggested maybe maybe some some questions from me at this point as well as time time later on. Yes. Uh, I'm going to raise this sooner or later. I know Tom Payne years ago uh, in his study of the next hundred years uh, listed the number of inhabitants on the moon and on Mars, and they kept going bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, I'm not sure that Mars uh, that the moon really is our best uh, survival place on the planet. It's kind of the same as the space station. Uh, you could really justify people being in the space station instead of robots. Uh, fine. I think people are in the space station because they need to learn how to go somewhere else. And I think the situation's the same at Mars, I mean at the moon. Uh, if we learn how to live there so that we can go somewhere else. And the explorers are going to be the first guys there. And, and the, the commercial guys are going to come in. And they have to justify the uh, expenses of the infrastructure, uh, they need to contribute with the explorers to build the infrastructure that the explorers leave. I think the moon is so that we can set up robots uh, and, and let those robots do the automatic uh, science uh, recording stuff. And, and it really is difficult to justify, I think, um, setting up a habitation on the moon. It's not
not that good a place to be, really. I, uh, I, I may be proved wrong in this, but uh, I just am a, a little bit uh, leery about raising the expectations of building great structures, uh, like, like setting up a Walmart before we know what we're going to sell. <laughs> what is it that's going to pay for the construction of these things? I don't think it's going to be the government. Uh, I would agree with you in general, certainly. Um, uh, some cases have been made for uh, commercial benefits from doing things on the moon. Um, I think that uh, the moon certainly is primar can be primarily viewed as a place where we learn how to live in space, build in space, and also I think there are the larger issues, uh, understanding human and plant physiology in, uh, in, in a spa space environment, um, and also the issue of um, reliability of, of machines. Uh, it's, it's, it hasn't been proven to me that we can actually build something that we can send people to Mars today. Well, if you have a good uh, transportation system and the machine breaks down, you send somebody there and fix it. But the cost of keeping somebody there all the time is pretty high. It is, and, and certainly the case has to be made. So you would prove, you would choose Mars as the first the, 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 the permanent, permanent settlement. Permanent settlement, exactly. Mm. Okay, and Robert, you, you have to live off the land on Mars. Right. You really don't have to live off the land on, on uh, the moon. Right. Uh, it takes so long to get to Mars and to, and to come back. You need to commit to permanence there. That's the place that's going to be short after two or three missions. Right. Yeah, the, the question is permanent settlement. Would you put your money uh, uh, in at Mars, or rather, you put your money on the moon for permanent present settlement purposes? Well, the production of fuel and that sort of thing justifies uh, having people there fixing the machines. You can get the machines to do that sort of thing but you're going to find it expensive to support people living there all the time. But this town is the perfect example of a, a place that really has no reason to exist other than it does. And they're building a, a, a casino over here that's going to cost $7 billion. Southwest Airlines is a little cheaper than a Saturn V to the moon. <laughs> right. <laughs> but the point is it is based on economics. And before there was a Saturn Southwest Airlines, there was a lot of cheaper forms, so as we go along, things get better. They get Let's cheaper. do it step by step. Is it possible to sort of assess your scientific research versus how to improve specific colonization? If you're going there for pure science, look at the budget of the National Science Foundation and see what they'll support. Just to conclude, uh, Kevin is, is kicking me here. Uh, just well, our, our, our time keeps me. So okay. I'm the the, the it only along. point I would make, and, and Buzz makes a good point, I guess the question is uh, how soon do we think we can actually go to Mars and make Mars viable? And that'll determine how long we have to be on the moon to do what we have to do to be able to go to Mars. And so that's still an open question. I agree. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker will be from the Cisco Corporation, uh, Dr. Hugh Arif. Okay, I'm not a doctor. The company is Cisco Systems. Oh, Cisco Systems. Okay. Can we go back? Used to drive by there pretty regularly. Sorry. Okay. First slide. Just go back. Okay. So, um, thank you for this opportunity uh, to talk about lunar communications infrastructure. And I'm going to focus on next generation global services uh, and how we can enable new uh, capabilities and behaviors. Okay. So the agenda is I'm going to talk about project constellation and the C3I requirements. Um, I'll uh, describe what C3I requirements are. Uh, new approaches using the internet protocol, as you can uh, imagine, everybody on the face of the earth uses the internet uh, protocol or IP, and I'm going to talk about that. A little bit about IP architecture for lunar missions. Also, what technology uh, demos we have done and what we are planning to do. Uh, and what are the uh, new capabilities that uh, are enabled by the use of IP? So as you know, uh, uh, Project Constellation or the vision for space exploration is uh, 
somewhat underway with the decision for the CEV coming in the next uh, few weeks. Um, in the future, though, there will be a lot of uh, elements of Project Constellation uh, around LEO and Cislunar, uh, around uh, low uh, lunar orbit, and on the surface of the moon. So uh, as far as communications are concerned, you look at the formula on the right-hand side and you do the math, anything more than three elements uh, creates a, a problem with uh, communications. Uh, say if you take uh, nine elements, you'll probably need about 36 interfaces. And the way um, communications are done right now, point-to-point, -point, fixed bandwidth, um, plan, circuit switch, uh, going through TDRS, uh, a priori schedule, uh, that will be very difficult when you have 36 elements uh, trying to communicate with each other. Similarly, for the lunar surface, uh, NASA's talking about a lunar uh, communications terminal, which is so shown in yellow, but that'll be talking to the ISRU uh, plant, the power plant, rovers on the moon, um, uh, astronauts walking around, the habitat, and each of those things may be talking to each other also. Who's gonna control and schedule those activities? Will NASA Johnson be scheduling through TDRS all those activities, I, I think it's going to be impossible, especially in light of the fact that TDRS only looks towards the Earth from geo and also sideways. And um, the deep space network is already oversubscribed. So you need something new, and that's why uh, the need for IP is probably coming together. I think NASA recognizes that. And on the left hand side, it's a very busy chart, but you see some ill at ease since interoperability, flexibility, scalability, and on and on. And those are the kinds of things that we are uh, spoiled on the face of the earth by using the internet protocol. You go to any hotel or any wireless scenario, you just uh, power up your laptop and plug in or use wireless and uh, your, rec uh, your laptop is recognized and you are on the internet. And same thing may have to be done for, for the going back to the moon. So uh, we believe in, in Cisco IP networking uh, to uh, offer next generation of global services for voice, video, and data uh, is the way to go. IP extends uh, terrestrial networking to space. It merges space communications and ground communications. And when I say space, I also mean lunar surface or lunar orbit uh, communications. And all, it all becomes seamless uh, to the end user because there are routers on board and networks uh, using open standards. Everybody builds to the same standard prices down, market expands, and, and everybody is, uh, is happy with that, just like we are with the internet. Uh, we are in the process of building uh, architectures for lunar missions, and I'm not going to go through all the elements here, but uh, you can see that uh, uh, there's a need for many, many links, and again, reiterating the point of using routers on board, that's, that's how we have to uh, proceed in the future. So. Uh, so so we, we have, uh, last time I reported back about the CLEO uh, or, or Cisco Low Earth Orbit uh, demonstration in space last time. We put a, uh, a, a COTS commercial $5,000 router in a UK DMC uh, satellite built by Surrey. And we have been doing in the last three years continued uh, testing. And that $5,000 router is uh, shown here. It's still working. Um, it's, uh, you can buy it. Cisco 3250. Uh, it has uh, uh, software uh, that has mobile IP, and we have demonstrated virtual mission operations. So we can do command and control, telemetry, down uh, file transfer, but also access to instruments on board. And this is being done right now. Uh, NASA Glenn has also tested for radiation tolerance this uh, router for uh, lunar surface and uh, low lunar orbit. So it works. Uh, we've also gone the next step uh, to a hardened space qualified router, which is at TRL-6. We ported our software into a BAE RAD 750 uh, uh, a board, and uh, NASA Goddard has done testing, and we need a flight for that. And this is a scenario, and I think I reported th on, on this last, last year. And we've done end-to-end -end, uh, voice and data transfer from the moon uh, to Earth and back. So uh, what we need is a flight demo. And the closest uh, we came to that was on a mission called LCROSS, which is um, uh, the lunar mission from NASA Ames uh, for uh, October 2008 launch, co-manifested with the LRO. Uh, and we were going to 
uh, we proposed an architecture for some live video back uh, from the moon uh, when the Earth departure upper stage separates from the Elcross spacecraft and then the Elcross precedes the uh, EDUS as it's known towards the moon for impact um, because of brevity of time unfortunately uh, into detail. But that would have been the first ever uh, demonstration for Project Constellation for using IP uh, in lunar vicinity. Unfortunately, we were turned down by the project manager uh, uh, to go forward uh, because of uh, risk associated with this. We could have shipped hardware in a month because this is uh, all COTS equipment. Uh, so, so the goal is uh, still to uh, offer the same kinds of services in, uh, in uh, uh, lunar, cislunar, and uh, 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 lunar uh, for, that, for voice, video, and data, voicemail, email, and, and things in, uh, of that nature. Uh, we actually uh, are uh, developing technologies for telepresence, which are just not uh, a glorified name for the old video conferencing, but rather a virtual um, uh, mix of uh, audio and video based on high definition. And um, in the coming months, you'll hear more about it. And my vision is, why not have this kind of a capability from the habitat or the science f facility on the lunar surface that uh, that actually brings uh, people together from, from right now in demonstrations around the world into a virtual uh, conference room. And uh, it is an experience, I've been through that, and it, you feel like you're sitting in the same room with people in, uh, you know, around the world. And so with a 2.7 second round tip uh, difference, uh, 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 time difference between uh, Earth and the moon, this could be uh, uh, demonstrated. Um, Another technology that uh, is coming out is WiMAX, uh, that is 802.16e uh, protocol ratified last December by the IEEE for uh, uh, non-line of sight and long distance wireless. Uh, right now wireless that we use 802.11a, b, and g only goes to about 300 feet or so. This perhaps may go to about 30 kilometers. There's another protocol called 802.11n has uh, products coming out right now as we speak actually uh, that uh, has bandwidth of uh, 100 megabits per second or higher perhaps going up to 500 megabits per second so in other words uh, uh, high definition TV is capable over wireless so um, flipping through the slides a little bit uh, uh, fast uh, one other technology that uh, we are using uh, post 9-11 that we developed was any radio waveform of IP so, in other words, you can use uh, uh, any uh, international waveform uh, radio and on the lunar surface, we could Chinese astronauts or Indian or, or, uh, or Russian astronauts along the U.S. astronauts uh, using voice and video uh, over IP. And the application that we have is for situational awareness. We developed this capability uh, with a satellite service provider called Apogee for situational awareness of fire firefighters displaying it on Cisco's IP phones, and then being able to communicate individually with those um, firefighters. There is no reason why we cannot do that on the surface of the moon when, when astronauts are walking around outside of the habitat or on rovers. So the goal is that all those ovals, uh, circle, ovals uh, that you see there with uh, the needs uh, in the future uh, for uh, ground uh, collaboration uh, and communications and vehicle health and on and on um, to talk to each other and be, uh, be interoperable, uh, be able to communicate in real time and we believe that uh, the internet protocol is the way to go and we are slowly working our way and demonstrating and I think this is the crowd that needs to come up with the uh, advocacy back home when you go back to your uh, respective organizations for the use of this technology. Thank you. Are there any questions? Okay, you're in a state of shock, I guess. No, there's one hand. Yeah. Oh, there is. Okay. Yeah. It, it's a bright light. Okay, yeah. yes, <laughs> you're, you're shining. Communications between the Earth and the Moon and interplanetary, you know, Mars Earth, uh, bandwidth is far more expensive than it is in any terrestrial environment. Right. Um, it seems to me that a combination of very smart, adaptive compression, you know, high resolution at the ends, but uh, inferences and uh, much beyond MPEG or JPEG 
would be called for to get the max out of this. Is, is that something that, that uh, it might even be appropriate for some of your virtual conferences? You are absolutely right on. Because of time limitations, I had to leave out something. And uh, so those are the kinds of uh, um, new uh, codecs, uh, new compression techniques. In fact, for the telepresence, we have uh, boiled down uh, HDTV to maybe three to four megabits per second per channel. So we are working in that area. Secondly, we're also demonstrating under contract with the US Stratcom for optical communications. And there's going to be a payload uh, perhaps in the 2008 time frame on the Pan Am Sat uh, uh, PAS uh, 14 satellite that will have a Cisco router on board. And uh, studies are being done right now. This was all in uh, the media about a couple of months ago. And so by demonstrating optical communications, uh, high bandwidth, uh, long distances, and also routing, and then adaptive uh, compression techniques, absolutely, you, you, you are right on. The, this is the need. And we need to do, NASA is actually behind demonstration of optical comm. The Japanese have demonstrated that uh, with Artemis, uh, um, the European uh, spacecraft. They have actually uh, demonstrated uh, optical comm from the spacecraft, the OICT uh, spacecraft, uh, to uh, ground. Uh, so NASA has not done that yet. Uh, and so, so you're right on. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Any others? Yeah, one more in the yes. back there. So what would it take to really prove out this technology? I mean, how big a, a, a project is this? What, what were you proposing on L-Cross, and um, what's it really take? OK, so uh, L-Cross uh, had um, three Cisco commercial routers, the same one that are f flying in space. And we have uh, uh, tested that. Those are $5,000 each. So. OK, five of those routers, maybe for testing. So those $25,000. And we had uh, COTS IP cameras, also wireless. Those cost $200 each. So you get the idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, the hardware cost we were going to give for free. Um, and we were going to help out in the integration and testing. Actually, we already purchased the camera, cameras and routers so, to start doing benchtop testing. And uh, then we got shut, shut off by, by uh, Ames management that uh, th this is something that will um, bring risk to their mission because this is, this is one of the first missions back. So we're talking minuscule amounts which were actually of no cost to NASA. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. So please don't consider this as a critique of, of that we are not moving forward. But this was an opportunity that was we were so close to actually doing this because this would have been a... Um, a payload that if it didn't arrive uh, by any fate of luck or um, didn't uh, work, could have been cut off without uh, impacting the mission of the uh, project. But it unfortunately didn't go forward. One more question okay, over please. here. Uh, I'm wondering, is there any way for a system to do this demonstration project on its own? Oh, Cisco is not a space company, and uh, that's not in its uh, business model. Uh, we are still a networking company, and uh, we have products, uh, both hardware and software, in uh, networking. And certainly, we can, you know, um, offer those. Uh, but for the actual missions, uh, for launching and operations, where the space sector has to come in, both commercial. Now. Uh, interestingly, NASA, our leading and cutting-edge space agency, is far behind uh, the DOD, the intelligence community, and the commercial community, not just in the U.S., but uh, others also, in taking on the acceptance of IP and routers on board. NASA is uh, lagging be behind. Uh, so we still need NASA. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. We had a hand up here. One of the problems that the major concern is utilizing this technology in terms of the conventional technology is the availability, the risk associated with the availability, security, and reliability of the whole concept. We're talking about the space application as opposed to the commercial networking, and this is so many problems. 
Right. So, so that is, uh, so in answer to your question, that is the first knee-jerk reaction that always comes from any space uh, uh, program, right? That this is new technology, and as you know, that uh, we cannot take on the risk. So that's the first thing. But to counter that, uh, let me uh, propose the argument. Every day, the NASDAQ transacts $1.2 trillion, okay? Mm -hmm. And that is all handled by commercial open standards-based technologies of the internet. If we can handle that kind of financial uh, risk using this technology, why not take it into space, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not proposing that you suddenly do a massive sea change, which NASA is proposing, by the way, by the C3I specification. The point is they have not flown a single router in space. Some people will argue the space station has uh, certain things, and I can talk to you offline about that. But a real COTS commercial router has never flown. And what we are suggesting is to start in taking baby steps, and LCROSS was one of them, and, and so on and so forth. So, so risk uh, can be uh, brought down by certain mitigation techniques, and those would be a roadmap of technologies in space. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very much. much. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Now for our third panelist, uh, Dr. David Livingston, uh, presenting what he advertises to be the skeptical view. A particularly um, sk a partic a particular skill area. Uh, good morning, and, and actually it's not a skeptical view, but, but um, <clears throat> first of all, I apologize in advance. That's a really bright light. Uh, if I get stuck with a coughing attack, I've had this problem for about two months better, it's random, it's involuntary, I don't need help, I need about 45 seconds for it to pass, and then I'm good to go again. I'm pretty medicated before this talk, so hopefully I will get through it. Um, I'm not skeptical, I share the dream that everybody in this room shares. And if I didn't share the dream, I wouldn't be doing the space show into five years now, uh, wrecking my life for it, wrecking my life financially for it, trying to build it profit, doing all sorts of things with it, it's because I have a dream and I have an action plan to take that dream and build it into reality. So I'm not skeptical, but I'm very reality-based. So that really is a bright light. So let me tell you a little bit about me, so, because I'm really something different than the space show. Uh, in a previous life, I was in business and I raised lots of money in investment and capital for oil and gas exploration. I specialized in wildcat well drilling. I drilled all sorts of wells, but my most fun, my most prestigious well, and my biggest failure as a dry hole was drilling with Arm & Hammer and Occidental Petroleum with a small group that I put together and raised money offshore Israel, 15,000 feet in the Mediterranean. If we had found the oil reserves that we were looking for in the natural gas, we would have a different Middle East today. And all we found was salt water and mud. Um, but it was a hell of a lot of fun, and uh, it was extremely costly. And my money was right there with my investors. And um, Arm and Hammer died shortly after that, and I think that was my last real oil venture because a lot of the laws changed, making that uh, something that wasn't as favorable as what it used to be. I've raised a lot of money and been involved in real estate development in shopping centers and single-family homes planned urban developments. Um, my MBA is in international business and economics. I've taught entrepreneurship and small business management for four years in business graduate schools. Uh, I've done, I've had all the SEC licenses known to man. I've been a registered investment advisor. Uh, I'm a licensed California real estate broker to this day. I did give up my SEC and investment advisor licenses because I didn't want to deal with the SEC paperwork and the requirement to keep the files for so many years. It's just too much for someone who's sort of anti-government. Um, <clears throat> I got my doctorate in business administration, mm -hmm. and uh, my dissertation was about uh, space commerce and specifically space tourism, and the space show was an evolution from that, which is now my full-time work. So I bring into this world a business perspective. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a physicist. I'm not a scientist. I've had to be dragged kicking and to learn engineering and physics and science, but every time I learn it, I still have this business perspective. So 
I have a reality check as my talk today. So for lunar infrastructure, the first part of the reality check is none of this exists. It's not real. And, you know, every time I walk through a casino in Las Vegas, I've got the greatest fantasies going that you can imagine. I mean, I'm really fantasy laden, but I know the difference between a fantasy and a dream. My fantasies as I walk through those casinos are really unlikely to happen. Now, yes, I know there is something called serendipity. There is a tail of a bell curve, and sometimes the extreme tail, which might be the fantasy, does become reality. I admit that, and I acknowledge that, and it happens a lot in science uh, and in engineering. Thank you. And um, I'm not discounting that, but I'm not really focusing on that as part of uh, what I have to say. Um, the, the reality is fantasies are very different from a dream. A dream is real. You can make a dream reality, but you need to make your dream based on a solid foundation and not bay mud. So um, the reason I say that the lunar infrastructure is not real, it's not reality, we don't know how to get back to the moon. We don't know what it's going to cost. We don't know what the infrastructure is really going to look like. It would be almost impossible right now today to cost this out, to build a, a really credible performa to try to figure it out. So notwithstanding all of this, what do you do? You've got to have the dream, and you've got to start someplace uh, to take that dream and turn it into a real action plan. So I always say you got to make the rhetoric match the reality. When, when you have rhetoric that builds unexpected, unrealized expectations, uh, it's dangerous, it's self-destructive. It turns people off. It leads to a lot of disappointment. Professionals and sophisticated people who know the difference, people who have money, people who have contacts and access, they know the difference. And you don't win friends and supporters by having rhetoric that doesn't match the reality. You don't win friends and supporters by having assumptions in a pro forma where nothing is based on a real point. So again, this is really hard to do when you can't even figure out what it's going to cost to get back to the moon and for sure when you're going to get back there and what your infrastructure or your transportation is going to look like. So you have to have really good assumptions that extrapolate from the reality of today into what might be plausible. When we drilled the Arm & Hammer oil deal, we had uh, pro formas for what kind of reserves we might find. So obviously the worst case is a dry hole and you find nothing, and that's what happened. Then you have an average case, what would be expected based upon the kinds of seismic information and geological reports we had. And we had tons of reality checks on that, because there are fields like that all over the world that you can say, OK, this structure, this kind of salt dome, this kind of geological formation produces this kind of reserve at this depth in the Gulf of Mexico or elsewhere in the Mediterranean or wherever. So we could say, it's reasonable to think that we're going to be in the ballpark. And then you have an extreme, this is the best case scenario. Even there, we had best case scenarios based on real producing wells. Well, we don't have anything like that today. So someone who knows how to read a set of pro formas and a business plan will look and see if your assumptions have any kind of reality or plausibility to them. And this is really important because you can have the dream and you can have no way to cost out and go to the moon, but now it's what you say, how you describe it, and how you build your projections for a business case that is going to make sense or not make sense. When you don't match reality with your rhetoric, you run into problems. We have created great engineering projects. In recent times, it's Hoover Dam going to the moon, the Golden Gate Bridge, which I'm fortunate to see every day. I mean, the list is endless. These were people's dreams at one time. But they did it with solid engineering, incremental steps built on what had come before them. And they had dreams. They didn't have fantasies. So I guess what I want to leave with, um, with you all today for lunar infrastructure is to realize that we're dealing in a world where nothing is real. Nothing exists almost impossible to come up with a business model. So when we talk about it, when we promote it, 
especially outside this room, into the world as general, into the general population. If you want to hold people, you've got to give them reality checks and incremental steps along the way to show how you can make all this unfold. And you have to have a reasonable action plan. And just having you know, wild expectations and wild rhetoric doesn't cut it. So my reality check today is to, to get grounded in reality in how we talk about, how we promote, how we discuss, how we display the kinds of things that we hope will come into being sometime down in the future. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? You knocked him dead, David. No. Yeah, right. I'm, here. <laughs> I'm glad no one has tomatoes. Oh, yes. I, I, I'm sort of just curious. I don't know if you even want to say this. The scope of uh, of the Arm and Hammer investment in, in that uh, in drilling effort. You mean how big it was? It was several hundred million dollars, and and uh, Hammer had other institutional oil programs in it, but my family was good for Arm and Hammer, and the Israeli group that had a participation in it were business partners of mine and other businesses uh, in drilling oil wells, not necessarily in Israel, but elsewhere. And I asked for a small piece, and they carved it out upon my request. And my partnership was a half a million dollars uh, because I had to go out and raise money and sell drilling this wildcat well, you know, in the Mediterranean in a war zone, you know, where oil has never been found before. And I thought a half a million dollars was probably reasonable for me to handle. And then I had to develop the business plan and the pro formas to go with it. I really couldn't use the data that Arm and Hammer had, although I had access to his seismic data and geological data. But I don't remember the exact amount, but it was multi, multi millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Very interesting comparison to some of our riskier space ventures. Well, and, and again, it was uh, about 15 years ago, so the drilling prices now are probably double if you were to do that well today. Mm -hmm. But something tells me it was around in the $150 million, $200 million range if it had been a completed well. And so it was not a completed well, so it would be a little bit more than half of that. But again, they had like BP and other companies as the major partners. We just had small little pieces. Another question? Yes. Um, it was really interesting to see sort of what we had in terms of the infrastructure and applied to your reality check, as well as the infrastructure in terms of communications that you talked about. Now, 15 years ago, um, you know, large developments were happening in the Middle East. Now we have one of the largest players there. It's because the entire um, global community needed a felt the urge for a uh, push for energy. Similarly, in the state of California, there was uh, there was the whole um, opening of the uh, push towards sort of finding gold there. What, what is the global <coughs> that we're riding on? You know, is it tourism? Is it entertainment that uh, people are going to go to the moon and continue? It's, it's the economic sustainability. Are people going to go to the moon because of that? Or... Uh, or is it, in, you know, is it uh, information, sort of the um, scientific knowledge about the environment there? I'd like to know from, from the experts here, what do they think we can actually create new space? <coughs> can, I couldn't hear some of it, so okay. can you translate it real quick? Well, I, I could take a try line. at that. She, she's wondering what the key drivers might be to actually produce some successful business plans. Um, and, I, and I could toss one in that I think, top of the list, I think tourism and entertainment is going to be a big driver. Uh, look around you at what, what kind of money can be made available for that if the business plans close. And I believe it completely that we need to prove the business plans at each phase. I think it's going to happen in a very stepwise uh, evolutionary pattern. It'll happen first with suborbital and then orbital and then move beyond that to, you know, to, to long duration lunar orbits long before we go down to touch down in the dust. Now, you can make a lot of money in lunar orbit before you go anywhere near dealing with the dust and the problems down on the ground that, uh, that Buzz referred to earlier that are very real. Uh, my answer is actually a little bit more complicated than that. 
if you're talking about the general public and justifying putting public money into space, we're not connecting the dots very well. NASA doesn't connect the dots very well, and advocacy organizations don't connect the dots very well. This is one of the specialties I do on my radio show, and I've published papers on it. And NASA says it's not their job to tell a story. I say to hell with it. It is their job to tell a story. They won't do it. They don't know how to do it. The thing is, what can space do for an individual person to give value in their life? And damn it, if we can't answer that question to the general public, then they don't need to have their tax dollars put into a space program. End of story as far as I'm concerned. If we can connect the dots that maybe we can deliver really cost-effective energy someday through space, or maybe we can deliver uh, other things that will benefit people through space. What I say on my radio show about the sector is, I do this because in the middle of the Cold War, when I grew up doing duck and cover grills in Tulsa in school, and we were at you know the brink of blowing each other up with nukes, we were building space things in space. We created treaties with our enemy to save each other's astronauts. We created treaties not to put weapons of mass destruction and stuff in space. Space is the path to a better humanity. And we need to make sure that people in America and around the world know that the solutions to our problems here on Earth come to us through space. And nobody says that. Now, if you're asking me what is a driver for a business deal, uh, it depends specifically on that business deal. If your deal is about tourism, you gotta show a way to close the business case on your tourism deal. You gotta show profits, you gotta have an exit strategy for people, but you gotta be reasonable because not everybody will invest in space because this is cool. Coolness doesn't give you a pass on business fundamentals that everybody else has to go through. If um, you know, if you have another kind of business deal, you got to be specific about that business deal. Was that it? Or? Yeah, I think that's pretty. I know yeah, we have to wrap this up. The time, our timekeeper is really waving at me right now. So I want to thank you for all your questions. Uh, if any of you have any more questions, please follow up with us uh, through the day and through the conference. And I thank you for your attention.